five is started. Sergeant Leonardo, can you start your recording, please? Cloud is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Finance. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you and good morning to everyone for attending uh, today's virtual hearing. I'm Council Member Daniel Drum, and I'm the chair of the Finance Committee. I've been joined by my colleagues. <clears throat> I don't have the list yet, but I'm going to look. Uh, Minority Leader Mario, uh, Council Member Moya, Council Member Kostowitz, Council Member Levine, Council Member and Chair Carnegie, Council Member Amphrey Samuel, uh, Council Member Ayala, Brooks Powers. Uh, Council Member Dharma Diaz, uh, Council Member Gibson, Grudenchik, uh, Levine, Moya, Powers, and Rosenthal. And if I get others, I will uh, make that announcement as well. Today's hearing will focus on four pieces of legislation. Intro number 2099, sponsored by Council Member Levine, would require the Department of Finance to report on the city's use of depository financial services. Proposed intro number 2100A, also sponsored by Council Member Levine, would require the Office of Management and Budget to report on the city's use of non-depository financial services. Intro number 2164, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, would require the Banking Commission to provide additional notice in regard to its public meetings and Reso number 1600, sponsored by Council Member Carnegie, would support the passage of pending state legislation that would authorize the establishment of public banks in New York. Last fiscal year, more than $106 billion passed through the city's coffers. The revenues came from taxes, state and federal sources, and municipal bond sales, but we didn't spend all these funds as quickly as they came in. Instead, much of that cash was first diverted into a network of bank accounts and short-term investments until such time as it was needed to satisfy liabilities like payroll or contracts or capital expenses. Today's hearing will explore the city's existing role as a customer of financial services and ask whether that could or should change. The goal of these bills and this hearing is not to question the integrity of the city's treasury function or the representatives who work hard to make the city a return on its revenue. Rather, the issue is one of transparency and oversight. By hearing these bills today, I hope we can learn more about what kind of deal the city gets on its deposits and non-pension investments and with its financial service partners. There is a rival model advanced not only by advocates, but also by some of our esteemed partners in Albany. They advocate that the city and or the state should have the authority to charter one or more public banks that should receive the city or the state's revenues and lend out excess cash in furtherance of social goals and at a profit. Over 100 years ago, the legislature of North Dakota chartered such a public bank. In the years, in the years since, that bank has made loans to local banks to help expand their reach and thereby expand banking access at better terms. To employers who as a result have been able to expand their payrolls and to students who have been able to borrow for college at subsidized rates. They were able to do this all while transferring more than 1 billion in profits back to the state's general fund. I don't presume to know whether that model can be adapted from the high prairie to New York City. But to even have that conversation, we first need to know more about our current practices. Before we hear from the administration, I'm going to invite the sponsors of the four bills to make remarks. 
And now I'd like to turn it over to council member Mark Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. Thank you for continuing to use your role as chair of the Finance Committee to advance progressive economic policy as you've done now for these three and a half years. And, and thank you for fitting in this hearing in the midst of what is the busiest season for the Finance Committee and for you and your staff. It's a really big deal that this is happening now. And I'm just so grateful for your leadership and making it possible. The profound inequality revealed and exacerbated by this pandemic simply cannot be ignored. Returning to the status quo is not an option. We need bold new tools now to battle inequality, to advance racial justice and environmental justice. And building a public bank in New York City is exactly the kind of bold plan we need. It would tap the potential of billions of dollars our city has on deposit right now at commercial banks. This is the public's money, and it could and should be invested in our communities, in green energy, in worker co-ops, in affordable housing, in community development credit unions. Instead, today, this money, our money, is sitting at institutions that finance fossil fuel extraction, private prisons, weapon manufacturers, and other harmful industries. Bad behavior in banking is nothing new, from redlining to the, for to the foreclosure crisis to high interest payday loans, Mainstream financial institutions have long exacerbated racial inequality, and they continued this bad behavior even during the pandemic. For example, making it difficult for small businesses to access PPP loans or charging exorbitant overdraft fees to low-income New Yorkers at the moment of great economic pain. Public banking offers a better way. It would let us put some of the city government's deposits in an institution that is accountable only to us to the people of New York City. And today, we're taking a giant step forward towards this goal with the first ever city council hearing on this topic. I wanna to say a quick word about the two bills that I am pleased to be sponsoring, intro 2099, which would require the city's Department of Finance to submit a quarterly report with the average daily balances, interest rates, and fees for each of the city's depository accounts. And intro 2100, which would require the city's Office of Management and Budget to produce a quarterly report on accounts at non-depository institutions, including money market accounts and bond issues with reports on balances, returns, fees, and a variety of other costs. We need this information. The public should have this information so that we understand where our money is and what is costing us. We must seize this moment to act boldly to tackle profound inequality exacerbated by this pandemic. A return to the status quo is not an option. The time is now to create a banking institution that would do what Wall Street hasn't and won't, invest the public's money to advance economic, racial, and environmental justice in New York City. And again, wanna thank you, Chair Drum, for bringing this legislation forward to a hearing and for fitting us into this busy calendar. We're grateful for your leadership, and I am so excited for this important conversation today. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Levine, and uh, thank you for your very kind words. Uh, we'll now hear from Councilmember Carnegie. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'm just really excited to be a part of this conversation and to be again in partnership with some of the most forward thinking council members, including the finance chair around issues that are germane, especially to marginalized communities like the one that I represent. Uh, we can never get to a place of social justice and equity without addressing um, banking and without addressing the inequity as it relates to um, uh, our financial institutions. So thank you, Chair Drum and the Finance Committee for, for hearing this important legislation today. I wanna to speak briefly in support of a resolution I sponsor, Resolution 1600. A public bank would be a powerful tool in service of the people of our city. A profits over people mindset has all sorts of damaging consequences from environmental degradation and indifference to the well-being of vulnerable communities to redlining and underinvestment in, the, gen in the, the genius of our community. A profits over people mindset misses so much we ought to value. That's why the public minded vision a New York City public bank would offer is so important. Our colleagues in the state legislature need to know that in founding a public bank, 
our city has the opportunity to put a multi-billion dollar voice behind our values, valuing MWBEs and small businesses, valuing our immigrant communities, valuing community land trust and worker co-ops, valuing community development financial institutions, valuing renewable, renewable energy and environmentally conscious construction and valuing so much more. Resolution 1600 and the legislation we consider today is one step on the road towards making a New York City public bank an absolute reality. I look forward to the testimony we'll hear today and the partnerships we continue to forge to center this empowering vision of public banking. I wanna close by expressing my profound gratitude to all those whose efforts got us this far. And I believe our collective efforts will get us over the finish line. Thanks to Council Member Levine and all colleagues or on the council who see the importance of these steps towards a New York City public bank. I also wanna express my gratitude for the years of hard work of all the advocates and community residents engaged in this issue. Thank you again, Council Member Drum, uh, like my colleague said, for fitting this in and making it a priority, especially in this season. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Cornegy, and thank you again also for your kind words. So today we are joined by representatives of the Department of Finance, Deputy Commissioner Jeff Shear, and Assistant Commissioner Mary Christine Jackman, who serves as the city's treasurer. Before we hear their testimony, I will turn it over to our committee council for some procedural announcements and then to swear in the witnesses. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, my name is Rebecca Chasen, and I am counsel to the New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Uh, before we begin with testimony from the administration, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called. Uh, we will begin with testimony from the administration, which we will be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the administration witnesses and you will be called on to so affirm at the end. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Deputy Commissioner Shear? I do. Assistant Commissioner Jackman? I do. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Shear, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Drum and members of the Finance Committee. My name is Jeffrey Shear, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services at the New York City Department of Finance. I am joined today by my colleague, Mary Christine Jackman, the city's treasurer. We're here to discuss a package of legislation in relation to the city's treasury and DOF's role with the New York City Banking Commission. DOF ensures that city deposits are protected in designated financially secure banks, promotes competition among banks endeavoring to provide financial services to the city in order to reduce costs and monitors the billing and administration of the bank accounts. Much of this work is done via the New York City Banking Commission, which designates banks for city deposits and makes recommendations on the interest rates to be charged for property taxes. This testimony will cover the two pieces of legislation which the Department of Finance would work with you on, Introduction 2164 and Introduction 2099. The Office of Management and Budget has submitted written testimony for Introduction 2100A. Introduction 2099, which was introduced by Council Member Levine, would require the Commissioner of the Department of Finance to make quarterly reports regarding the department's accounts of deposit, disaggregated by account and re-aggregated by bank or trust company. As the bill is written, the department offers its support as long as a few changes are made, such as providing adequate time for implementation and excluding the city's smallest accounts from reporting. 
overall, this bill is something that we look forward to working with you and the administration on later in the process. Introduction 2164, which was introduced by Council Member Rosenthal, would require the New York City Banking Commission to provide notice of public meetings in the city record and on its website no less than 30 days before the date of a public meeting. It also would require that the notice be electronically transmitted to the office of the Speaker of the Council, each council member, and the chairs of all community boards no later than the date the notice is published. As is the case with the previous bill, we support the spirit of the bill with the reduction of the notice period and or adding a provision to address emergency cancellations. In the interest of public transparency, the Banking Commission complies with the New York State Open Meetings Law, provides notice of meetings to the Speaker's Office in the city record and on the Banking Commission website 14 days in advance and provides a live video stream for all of its meetings. However, we believe that the 30-day notice period could prove problematic in the event that a meeting needs to be unexpectedly rescheduled since the Banking Commission is legally obligated to meet certain deadlines, such as the May 13th deadline to make property tax interest rate recommendations to the City Council and the biannual May 31st deadline for bank designation. I want to thank Chair Drum and members of the committee for taking the time to listen to our testimony. And I am here along with Ms. Jackman to answer any questions that you may have regarding the legislation. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm going to go now to questions that I have and then we'll turn it over to the uh, sponsors and uh, and then to other council member questions. So my first one is in relation to uh, intro 2099. And for the benefit of those listening, can you please describe the functions of the treasury division and DOF's role in managing the city's cash? Yes. So I'm going to let um, the city's treasurer, Mary Christine Jackman, review all of the functions of the treasury division. Good morning. The Treasury Division is responsible for every penny into and out of the city. We have a, a section that's devoted to the cash management that makes sure that all of the money is um, accounted for and recorded and then properly invested. We have a division that's called Banking Services, which is the group that would be doing the reporting for intro 2099. And they, um, they are responsible for all of the RFPs for banking services. They're responsible for all of the relationships. They're responsible for all of the, um, all of the bank, day-to-day -day bank operations and making sure that the correct signatories are on each account, that the correct services are on each account and that all accounts are still needed and necessary. And then we have, um, we're responsible also for court assets. So our court assets division is taking care of trust accounts and parole or bail money. And then we have um, another division that does strictly analysis for like the budget and things like that. And thank you. Thank you. And um, can you uh, tell us how many staff are in the treasury division and what are their titles and are there any vacancies? Um, in the treasury, there's um, currently 27 employees. Um, there's many different titles. We have a director of cash management and he has mm -hmm. three um, people reporting to him. We have, mm -hmm. um, we have the director of, um, of port assets and she has a number of people reporting to her. And then we have the um, bank analysis division and there's a director and two people in that division. 
And then in the banking services division, there should be a director and four um, reports. And thank you. Uh, we have been joined by council members Kumbo and Lewis as well. Um, you mentioned that um, uh, you have RFPs. Can you uh, describe the types of RFPs that are issued by you? Oh, of course. Um, right now, we, we are completing the central treasury RFP, which is for services for deposits and investments and custody and um, other of the general larger banking need. Then we'll be issuing a new RFP in a few months for banking services, which includes um, many of the things that most people would think of in that it's like the school accounts, it's, it, it's other agency accounts for programs or um, accounts for grants. There's also a section of accounts for escrow accounts because the city's responsible for a lot of money that doesn't technically belong to the city, but we're the guardians of it. So there's, there's all of those accounts that will be under the um, banking services contract, RFP. Then there'll be another RFP for miscellaneous banking services that covers absolutely everything else that wasn't covered by the previous two RFPs. And those are the major, those are the three major RFPs that we do. We also have like a um, RFP for transportation of cash because we have some localities that the cash needs to be transported safely. Um, we have a couple of RFPs that we issue for other ancillary financial, um, financial needs, but that, that ensures that we're getting the best and the lowest price for the city. And you mentioned schools. Do you mean individual schools, budget accounts, and or PTA? Um, the, the, the city tax ID should only be on official school accounts. And right now, as you know, there's 1,604 different schools. So we have bank mm -hmm. accounts for each one of those schools. And a number of the schools have additional accounts for other needs that they have. So we, we the tax the city's tax ID is on the official accounts. Okay, and can you tell us the cost for the RFPs? It depends on what what's bid. Um, the when when we go out for RFP, we we put out a list of the services that are needed, and then the banks that respond provide their pricing. And, and there's a range of pricing depending on the institution that responds. Can you provide us with that information after the hearing? Uh, I will see what, what, um, what we have available from, from purchasing, yes, that. We certainly can provide um, all three current contracts to yeah. the committee after the hearing. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, do you know how many depository bank accounts the city currently has? And can you describe their different uh, purposes? Sure, right now we have over 4,000 accounts, but a number of those are escrow accounts. So the actual working um, city bank accounts, we have about, give or take, because we're always in the process of opening and closing accounts. We have 3,176 as of, May, of March 31st. So do the purpose is, did you, I'm sorry. No, no, so go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I was um, just going to say the purposes are, you know, the happy purposes are revenue collection. We like those accounts, but there's also accounts necessary for liability disbursements and, and vendor payments. There's special purpose accounts that depend on like grants or special programs that we have where the money needs to be segregated. We have, um, as, we, as I said, we have the escrow accounts, we have court cases, we have payroll accounts, we have agency accounts, which are specific to their programs and their needs. Um, and then we have the BDD accounts, which is the banking development districts. So do the agencies have direct access to the accounts or are they managed by DOF? DOF helps um, make sure that they get the best pricing on their accounts. Although they're free to go to any designated bank if it's appropriate, but they usually come through DOF because we have the expertise 
and we can help them make sure that the right um, safeguards are in place on their on their accounts. And, and how do you put those controls on the account to ensure that they're used for the proper purposes? Um, we set them up with the banks so that um, the specific safeguards are on the accounts and that um, we, we have a process where we make sure that not just anyone is a signatory on an account, um, depending on their function and their, their need to be part of, of the signatory process. Um, in general, what is the uh, range of amounts that are held in each of the city's accounts? And do you know how much is being held in each account right now? Um, I know as of last night, yes. Um, I can give you um, the, the numbers that have been thoroughly checked um, are March 31st. And we had as much as zero in some accounts because those are sweep accounts and all of the money is taken out every night. So of those accounts that have zero, then the highest account on March 31st was $196 million. And that was, that was one account. Now, keep in mind that the money is constantly moving through these accounts. And so that's a point in time. So as of March, there was 1.5 billion in, in all of these accounts across the city. As of last night, there was 1.2 billion. Okay, thank you. Sorry for my dogs barking. Um, All good. <laughs> the city's cash flow is currently handled on two separate tracks. DOF manages cash through depository services and the Controller's Bureau of Asset Management is responsible for managing investments in cash equivalents. What is the logic both in holding some of our money in cash and some in cash equivalent investments? Um, the logic in that is to try and have the money work to the fullest advantage for the city. The investments, of course, because they're for set time periods, they earn higher rates of interest. The cash in the accounts um, usually isn't staying there very long. It's usually moving through for another purpose. And so that, that money, um, the reason that we accept lower return lower interest on those accounts is because the money is highly liquid. And, and can you just describe the logic for having the two different uh, functions handled by two separate offices? Um, I, that, that predates me. Um, and um, I, I think that goes back quite a ways, but I, I will research it further. Um, that that's just how New York City chooses to handle it. So do you coordinate with the controller's office um, uh, while you're separately handling these two functions? Constantly, we're con in constant contact with them. We're constantly telling them what we see as our forecasted outflows. And, um, and then we um, advise them as to where they should be putting the money when we're going to need it next so that they can invest for the longest time period possible while still having the money available. Um, and we're, we're in constant contact with them about needs and because things change, you know, um, a grant or, or money comes in sooner than expected or money has to go out sooner than expected. So we're, we're in constant daily, daily, multiple times during the day we're in contact with the controller's office. Okay, thank you. And now in regard to uh, the Reso 1600, sponsored by Council Member Carnegie, do you have an opinion on um, how well um, New Yorkers are served by the existing banking institutions and arrangements? I think that the entire group is working as hard as we can to make sure that the citizens of New York are served well. <laughs> okay, uh, let me go down to my next question. Are you aware of whether the administration has evaluated the state legislature's uh, public bank proposals or any other public bank proposals? So we, the Department of Finance has not fully evaluated the proposal. Um, our opinion um, at a high level is that um, we are going to defer to the state legislature regarding the establishment of public banks we do feel it is very important in considering 
um, the establishment of a public bank that um, consideration be given for protecting the large initial investment needed to capitalize a new bank. Deputy Commissioner, can you speak to some of the pros and cons of a public bank? Well, I think that um, you and Council Member Levine have spoken very eloquently about some of the, the pros for having a um, public bank, and we do not dispute that. Um, we do feel that um, establishing a public bank is a very um, complex task to do, and that um, it can be challenging for a public bank to balance the need to protect the public funds that establish the bank, capitalize it, um, versus um, the important public um, goals to provide better, cheaper services from the banking community. So um, there is a tension there and we think there has to be a lot of important um, work done to ensure that if such a bank is created, that the public funds are protected. Okay, thank you. I'm sure we're gonna hear more about that later on as well. Uh, now in regard to Council Member Rosenthal's uh, legislation, can you describe the process of how the Banking Commission currently makes uh, notices of its uh, public hearings and what are the existing legal requirements that govern your public noticing process. I noticed you said you had concerns about the May date and the 30 days uh, issue. So can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yes, so I, I will start and then Treasurer Jackman um, will provide details. So um, we do follow the state's open meeting law um, and that requires 72 hours notice. We exceed that requirement by providing 14 days advance notice. And we do currently publish in the city record and we do currently um, inform the council speaker um, of the meetings. Um, the two meetings that are um, required are the ones for our recommending to the city council interest rates charged on delinquent property tax payments. Um, at that same meeting, we also recommend um, the early payment discount rate for property taxes. And by the New York City Administrative Code, we are required to make the, that recommendation to the council no later than May 13th every year. The other meeting that is required is every other year, the Banking Commission makes its designation of which banks can hold deposits from city agencies. We are currently in a year where that is occurring. So we have received applications from banks and we are processing them. And the Banking Commission must make its designations by the end of May. So in those two examples in particular, we want to make sure that if something happens, if one of the three um, Banking Commission members for whatever reason can't make a meeting that we don't have to push out the meeting 30 days and then be in conflict with um, legal requirements, um, especially a legal requirement um, where we have to report to the council as we take um, council requirements very seriously. Mary Christine, um, Treasurer Jackman, is there anything that you would like to add that I may have omitted? Well, I, I think it's important to know that we've always done at least 14 days notice that we do publish in the city record, that we do notify council as soon as possible, um, and that the, the word gets out. And then we stream every single meeting now. So I think that we're, we're definitely with the spirit of it. It's just hard to get the comptroller's office the mayor's office and the finance office to have time available when, when you're talking about deadlines. So we, we definitely have to meet the 513 deadline and we definitely have to meet the 531 deadline. So if anything were to happen in there and, and if the pandemic's taught us anything, it's taught us that things happen. Um, 
the 30 days is really problematic. So that's, okay. that's the only reason why we're, why we're asking for a little bit more consideration on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're thank sure you. sure that that's something that um, we can work out with the council. We want to be flexible. And again, we support the um, underlying spirit of the bill. Right, I understand, yep. Uh, how many times a year does the Banking Commission meet? Are, are they, and are they typically held like the same time every year or is it quarterly? How does that work? So uh, there are, usually there is one or two meetings a year, depending on whether there is um, a year where we are designating banks. So um, this year is a year with two meetings. Um, some years there is only one meeting for the um, property interest rate recommendations. Um, it is possible that if there is a pressing need that um, the Banking Commission could have a special meeting. Those do not occur frequently, but um, occasionally. Okay, now I know you mentioned some of the business that's addressed at the meetings. Um, is there any other business that's discussed? And is there any type of business that is conducted outside of the public process? So the, the other business I can think of is um, the BDD program, the Banking Development District program. Um, so deposits made by the city, um, that's usually done through um, Banking Commission meetings. I can't think of um, anything else that comes to mind for the moment. Um, I defer to Treasurer Jackman if, if there's um, other business in the commission. I'm not aware of any business that the Banking Commission does that is not part of um, the public meeting process. It, it is my understanding that there is nothing done outside of the public meeting process, everything is handled with public meetings. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Council Member Levine who has questions. And I do see that we've also been joined by State Senator Sanders and also by Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer. Okay, Council Member Levine. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that excellent line of questioning. I neglected to thank some of the staff uh, in my opening statement who have worked so hard to make this hearing possible in the midst of their busiest time of year. They would normally be working round the clock just on the budget stuff, but I'm really grateful to Rebecca Chasen and Noah Brick and also on, on your staff, Mr. Chair Robin Forrest, who uh, has been uh, incredibly active and helpful in all this. And also similarly, I'm, I'm grateful that the Department of Finance is here today in, in the midst of a busy season. So thank you, Dep Deputy Commissioner Scheer and and Treasurer Jackman. Um, I, I, I heard you cite a number for the amount that we have on deposit at commercial banks, um, but I'm not sure if that was all inclusive of some of the money that we have in non-depository institutions. And I understand that some of that might be run through OMB, uh, but can you give us a sense of the totality of money we have on, uh, that we have at both depository and non-depository institutions? The, uh, yes, council member, um, the money on deposit, as I said last night, was 1.2 billion. Thank you, sorry, mute issue there. Okay, so, so how much of that is in depository institutions? The 1.2 billion is in is in the depository institution. And and but what about money and money market funds and other types of instruments? I don't believe we have anything in money market funds, but that would be um, that would be the investment piece. And how much does this vary over the course of a year? What would be the high water mark of the? Um, well, the the money's always in motion, so. So I would think that somewhere we might be a little bit north of the 1.5 billion that we hit on the 31st of March, but I would expect that most of the time we would be under that. Right, understood. What kind of fees are we incurring with these institutions? What, what is the total annual outlay for banking fees? 
may I may I please come back to you with with the correct number for that? Um, I I can ballpark it, but but I'd like to give you the correct number. Certainly, but that, this, this this is extremely important information because yes, yeah, understood, understood. And and similarly, can you um, give us the total of interest earned collectively over the course of a year? All right. I will get that figure for you. Okay. And and remember uh, that that number is going to vary too with the um, with the interest rates in the economy. You know. I understood, but you could give us the most recent year if that's available. Yes. Does the city concern itself at all with the broader business practices of the banks where we're depositing money? Does it concern ourselves with the kinds of project that they're lending to and investing in, whether it be fossil fuels or other types of investments that are inconsistent with our goals as a city? I would, council member, I would say that um, the fact that we decided not to use Wells Fargo services for the last time period um, exemplifies the fact that we put the city's values into our actions. And that was based on their low CRA rating, correct? Correct. Um, are you considering re-engaging with Wells Fargo now? Well, they, they have applied to become a designated bank again, yes, for the next time period. Okay, and g g given that, uh, I believe their CRA rating has increased, I'm not certain about that. It has, it has tremendously increased, yes. What about their investment in fossil fuels? I don't know about that. So that is that a factor at all that you consider? Um, the, the Banking Commission has a number of different factors that are considered. I don't know that fossil fuels are specifically considered. And there are other sectors as well, whether it's uh, weapons manufacturers, private prisons, that many of these institutions are lending to and investing in. Do you know if any of that is considered by the Banking Commission? I would think that that's considered in the overall um, understanding of the of the bank's activity in the community. The CRI rating is is an important tool. It doesn't take account in the considerations uh, like, like the ones I just mentioned. And uh, furthermore, a, a bank CRA rating is a national status that it it receives not based on its work in New York City, et cetera. And it says nothing about the extent to which a bank is investing in things like um, MWBEs, affordable housing, worker co-ops, uh, green technology, et cetera, in our city. Uh, and I, I know you're aware of that. I, I, just, I just want to state that so the public understands that the CRA rating is, is a fairly crude measure of the extent to which a bank is acting consistent with the values and interests of the city. And, I, and, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, I, uh, I wanna understand exactly the city's position on, on the two bills that I'm pleased to sponsor today, uh, uh, 2099 and 2100. And I, I believe that you commented, or forgive me, it might've been you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Chair, on, on 2099 uh, and have deferred comment on 2100 to OMB. Do I have that correct? That is correct. And you're, you're, I, I did appreciate what sounded like a broadly supportive statement to 2099. So I wanna acknowledge that and, and thank you for that. Um, and you're it sounded welcome. like you're, thank you. And so uh, it sounded like your concerns were twofold. One, uh, on the reporting time period. Uh, and secondly, on um, uh, a, a, a wish to exclude some of the smaller institutions. Could you expand on that second point? Um, why and, and uh, I guess how you would uh, de determine um, what the dividing line would be there? Yes. So our concern is excluding the escrow accounts. There are roughly 3,200, 3,176 to be exact, um, depository accounts across all city agencies. That's a lot of accounts to report on. And the um, the cost and the interest rates vary. Um, and as Treasurer Jackman indicated 
before while we have three major contracts, city agencies and schools uh, may elect to open accounts um, at banks that are not part of those three contracts. So doing a report on all 3,200 um, would be onerous and some of those accounts are small or have um, very little activity. So we would like to work with you and the council on establishing some type of threshold. One um, variable that we're looking at um, is the account balance. So when we look at those accounts, we find that um, if you take those um, accounts that have balances in excess of $100,000 represent 8% or about 260 of the bank accounts, and yet they represent um, over 98% of the deposits. So we think reporting on 260 accounts would frankly be an easier report for the, for the council and the public um, to go through, um, and certainly would be less burdensome um, on us and our staff to produce. And I, I appreciate that, but I'll say that some of the smaller institutions are those that uh, uh, actually may be doing more mission-driven work in our city, uh, whether they're smaller Black-owned banks or other minority-owned banks, um, or even, uh, I, I should ask whether we have any money on deposit at wonderful institutions like community development credit unions, which uh, are, are lending in a way that's consistent with some of the values that I laid out before. So. Uh, I guess, could you, could you describe the, ex the extent to which we have banking relationships with some of those smaller mission-driven institutions? Yeah, so I'm going to let Treasurer Jackman uh, address that, but I do want to point out that the criteria we're looking at isn't a threshold um, on the institution level, but right. on the account level, so that um, smaller banks that are handling um, larger accounts would still be included in the reporting. Right, although there's probably a great correlation there. We could look at it, but... Uh, Un understood. Right. We, we just want to be clear that um, we're not saying, oh, it, um, we would automatically exclude smaller banking institutions in our reporting. Um, that's not our intent. Understood. And, and Treasurer Jackman, were you, were you going to weigh in no, on I, this? I, I was question? going to... Yeah. I was going to weigh in on that, that it, we weren't excluding any institution. We were strictly going to use a threshold that above a certain threshold, we would, um, we would be reporting to you because above the threshold, you know, using, using a certain threshold, like as, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Shear said, we would be reporting on nine, over 98% of all the money, which, which I think is more useful than, than having all of the detail with the little accounts that only have, um, that have much lower balances. Okay, I, I, I didn't hear a, a comment, as I mentioned earlier on intro 2100, and I believe you're deferring to OMB, and they may have submitted written testimony, which, which I didn't actually see, if, forgive me, but can either of you uh, describe OMB's position on intro 2100, or the administration's position more broadly? Yes. So the, the OMB testimony indicates that OMB um, supports the spirit of that bill. Um, they, um, they indicate that much of the information is publicly available. Um, they do want to work with the council. They're concerned um, about the um, reporting requirements being too burdensome and they are suggesting that the reporting um, be done annually rather than quarterly. And are they actually not, do they, do they not have a leader here uh, ready to testify, OMB? So, uh, OMB is not here to testify. That's why they submitted written testimony to the Council Finance Committee um, this morning. It's, it's just a very vague statement. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to explore it further. And it's a reminder that we do have money in money market accounts and bond issues and other places that are not depository institutions, but all the same considerations apply. The city 
needs to know, are we getting a good deal? Could we do better with that money elsewhere? Could we do better if it was in a public bank, for example? So there's a lot of relevant questions. And, you know, uh, we're, we're all sensitive to reporting burdens, but there's a, there's a real imperative for the public to understand um, because the stakes are so high. And, you know, it shouldn't take a FOIL request for the city or advocates to learn uh, some basic questions about the fees we're paying and the interest we're earning when again, it is the public's money. So uh, I, I regret OMB is not here to speak further on that, um, but, but we feel pretty strongly that the public needs to know uh, and that regular reporting uh, would actually be a win-win for everybody's interest. So- Yes, council member, I'm, there's one more, um, note that I want to add on the OMB testimony. So they also indicated that the city does not utilize certain financial instruments outlined in the legislation, such as non-pension investment pools or credit default swaps. A and the one um, issue that the Department of Finance has is that um, that legislation specifically references lockbox bank accounts, but those accounts would be covered by um, intro 2099 because um, the lockbox operations are associated with depository bank accounts. So 2099 would cover um, those accounts. Okay, well duly noted. And I, I've, I've extended way more than uh, the allotted time and I'm grateful for the chair uh, for his flexibility on that. Um, and I know we have other members who are waiting to ask questions. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause now and, and I'll turn it back to you chair uh, or uh, perhaps committee council Jason to uh, cue the next speaker. Thank you again for- Just for your before time. we go back to, to council, yes. uh, council member Levine, we'll follow up with OMB about uh, the questions that you asked Thank and you. Uh, get back to you on that as well. Thank, Thank you chair, appreciate that. Uh, so, Chair Drum, I don't see any council members that have raised their hands at this time, but if any council members want to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function um, and you'll be called on. Uh, seeing none, Chair, uh, if you'd like, we can move on to the public portion of the testimony. Yes, and if I could just ask finance to stay, we do have Senator Sanders, who is sponsor of the legislation in Albany. Uh, and I'd like to have him um, give his testimony. Okay, so we will now hear testimony from the public. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Um, uh, so please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce uh, that you may begin uh, your testimony before beginning and you will have three minutes to present your testimony. Um, so first we will hear from uh, State Senator James Sanders, followed by Day De Del Rio. Starting time. It uh, looks like maybe the Senator needs a, a few moments, so we can move on to Day De Del Rio, um, followed by Jamie Weisberg, and we'll come back when he's available. Start in time. Hi, um, so I'm Andy Morrison, and I'm, I'm testifying um, in, uh, instead of Day, my colleague Day um, at New Economy Project. So thank you very much. Um, good morning, Chair Drum and members of the committee. Again, I'm Andy Morrison. I'm Associate Director at New Economy Project, and we really Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in enthusiastic support of intros 2099, 2100, 2164, and, and resolution 1600. Together, these bills represent the first key steps toward formation of a democratic financial institution that can ensure that New York City's public money is used for the public good, to advance racial equity, and a just recovery. We work at New Economy Project with community groups to build an, an economy that works for all, 
based on principles of racial justice, cooperation, democracy, equity, and ecological sustainability. And we convene and coordinate Public Bank NYC, which is a coalition of more than 40 organizations from across the city that are working to create a public bank chartered and mission driven to invest in black, brown, immigrant, and other historically redlined New York City neighborhoods. We applaud the council for taking this major step forward to make public banking a reality in New York City. These bills will lay critical groundwork for the creation of what would be the first municipal public bank in the country, right here in New York City. And we all know that COVID-19 has laid bare deep inequities at the core of so many of our institutions. Public banking is key to a just recovery. Research from around the world um, has shown that countries that have public banks have been more resilient in the face of the economic devastation wrought by the COVID-19 pan pandemic. And we really see public banking as a critical opportunity to divest public money from banks that harm people, communities, and the planet and invest in racial justice and a just recovery. It's no secret that Wall Street banks have systematically redlined and otherwise harmed New York City neighborhoods of color. To name just one example, uh, according to recent research we did, New York City's designated banks that we've been discussing today uh, have exacted more than $5 billion in predatory overdraft fees in 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic devastated our city. That's $5 billion out of primarily low-income communities and communities of color around the country and here in, in our city. And J.P. Morgan Chase, um, which we understand, understand holds more city deposits than any other bank, is actually the worst offender siphoning a billion and a half dollars in 2020 from, from folks struggling. It's also the world's largest um, funder of fossil fuels. And one important note we wanna make about our analysis is that in order to find out which banks have um, city deposits, and in order to find out which ones have the largest share of city deposits, we had to put in a FOIL request. And it was extremely difficult to get adequate information from the city. In fact, it took months. And- um, I'm expired. We, that, that underscores the need for intros 2099 and 2100. Um, so let's make this happen. A public bank can help transform our economy um, and advance racial justice and a just recovery. And thank you so much for the time today. And thank you for um, putting forth this really powerful package of bills. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Jamie Weisberg followed by Christopher Fasano. Starting time. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Trump, uh, Councilmember Levine, and all the council members that are on the committee and joining today. I am speaking in support of all the introductions and resolution today on behalf of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. We're a nonprofit member organization made up of over 80 neighborhood based affordable housing, equitable economic development organizations throughout New York City. A core piece of our work is actually holding banks accountable for their responsibilities under the Community Reinvestment Act, which is one of the major civil rights acts passed in response to discrimination and redlining. And it has leveraged tens of billions of dollars in New York City. But even with the CRA and our other hard-earned civil rights banking laws, discrimination, redlining, and harmful practices persist, such as the overdraft fees that has already been uh, mentioned, ATM maintenance fees, branches are closing left and right in the communities that we are working in, black and brown communities. Um, barely 10% of all home purchase loans go went to black borrowers in 2019 before the pandemic, which is a fraction of the population. And we are often paying attention to the banks that are financing bad acting landlords that are harassing and displacing tenants. So with tens of billions of dollars going through and into commercial banks each year, regardless of their CRA record, because even with all of this, 95% of banks pass their CRA exams. So the city should have a higher standard for banks with which they do business. We have tried over the years to do this and with some pushback. So we think that having a public bank, public dollar should go toward the public good is really what it comes down to, to benefit our communities. And the public bank would do this by lending directly or through mission driven entities. It would be harder to use our public dollars to support deep affordable housing, equitable banking, small business loans, the things that we need to recover from this pandemic. And unlike CRA regulated banks, this would be the core mission of the public bank. So it wouldn't be done some alongside other activities that are at best uh, ben, you know, less beneficial and at worst harmful. And we actually think it can raise the bar for banks in the city because it will provide models for other banks to adopt and opportunities to strengthen these institutions, these mission-driven institutions like CDFIs 
credit unions that are going to invest in mission-driven developers and um, be permanent affordable housing, supporting good quality jobs and all the things that we are working to do here in New York City. And I will tell you, I have tried to pick apart the deposits and the fees, and I have done a lot of research on this topic, and I'm happy to share it, and it's still confusing, took hours, and I'm sure I'm missing pieces. So these transparency bills are really critical to understand what's happening in our city. Um, so I really urge you to pass these, which will lay the groundwork for a public bank and also to support the resolution that supports the New York Public Banking Act. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, we have been joined by Councilmember Adams. Good to see you, Jamie. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, thank you. We'll now hear from Christopher Fasano, followed by Jamel Henderson. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the committee. My name is Christopher Fasano. I am a senior staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice, a nonprofit civil legal service provider. I'm also a member of the Legal Services Staff Association Local 2320 in UAW Region 9A. Mobilization for Justice, the Legal Services Staff Association, and UAW Region 9A are all proud members of the Public Bank Coalition. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of the three intros under consideration today. Each is important in its own right, providing much needed transparency to how the city banks. But together, they do much more. They lay the groundwork for a public bank that will democratize municipal finance. What animates this movement is simple. Public revenue should remain in the public domain. The public should decide how the public money is invested, not Wall Street. And those investments must always serve the public. I'd like to talk briefly about what a public bank would mean to mobilization for justice, my union, and the New Yorkers we serve. Every day we grapple with the housing crisis, representing tenants in eviction proceedings and homeowners facing foreclosure. The solution is structural. The city needs more permanently affordable housing. A public bank could achieve this aim in a variety of ways. It could invest in social housing for low and middle income households. It could help to originate and refinance affordable home loans, particularly in historically redlined districts. And it could take its successful model like the Community Restoration Fund, which the city used to buy defaulted home loans and then modify them on affordable terms and expand it dramatically. My clients are also the 11.2% of New Yorkers who go unbanked and the 21.8% who go underbanked. They fall victim to predatory financial instruments just because they lack basic banking services. Most recently, they had to track down paper stimulus checks, which the IRS sent to 26 million households over the past two months and they'll likely have to do the same when the IRS advances the child tax credit later this year. A public bank could fix this problem. Whether it was the United States Postal Savings System, which opened accounts for immigrants 100 years ago, or the German public banks, which did the same for refugees and asylees five years ago, only public entities like public banks can guarantee basic financial services for all members of the public. Thank you for your time and your attention to this vital matter. We look forward to working with you in the near future to realize this vision and create a public bank here in New York City. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the next member of the public, I'd um, like to recognize Council Member Brooks Powers, who would like to ask a question. Council Member Brooks Powers, are you there? Okay, let's move on to Jamel Henderson um, while we try to connect with the council member. Oh, one moment. I think council member Levine also has a question. His hand is raised. Hello, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Well then council member Levine. I, I, actually, I'd love for uh, Mr. Henderson to speak and then I'll follow uh, him after this panel to ask my questions. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. Oh, well, good morning. Still happy Wednesday to you all. It is great to see some familiar faces and I'm honored to be in this space to talk to you about something that's very important. My name is Jamel Henderson. I am a proud four time graduate of the City University of New York, and I'm honored to be in this space representing an amazing organization called New York Com Communities for Change. And what we're here to do is to represent the organization and I'm honored to represent them in saying that we are in fully support of introductions 2099, 2100 and 2164 
as well as Resolution 1600. I want to put it in different context because I submitted my testimony, but I want to give realistic perspective. And this is something that we should consider as to why it's important we should support public banks. First of all, many New Yorkers who are hardworking individuals like myself, who look like me, are still having challenges financially. And when you have banks charging us money that we don't have, or that could be used for something essential, especially in this moment right now, there is a big problem. Currently right now, the, I'm pretty sure there is some corporate Wall Street executive, CEO bank executive that is talking about how they can make more money off of the backs of our communities. There are uh, real estate developers that are talking to these commercial banks to try to figure out how they can make more money off of us. None of us know where our overdraft fee money is going. None of us know why we're being charged monthly fees. None of us know why we're going through the even more tedious processes of trying to get a loan or a mortgage just to support our everyday lives. A public bank will be of, by, and for the people. The city of New York is always saying that we like to lead the way. Well, here's an opportunity right now to do that. This is an open and shut case. I'm an educator, I'm in a doctoral program right now. And one of the things we talk about is issuing a problem statement. You've heard the problem statement. Now it's time to implement and see what happens. And I implore this council to fully support these bills and let's give the people that look like me, that look like you, the opportunity to have transparency and knowing where their money is going, to have investments that's gonna directly impact our communities and take our money out of investments that are harming our planet, that is harming our housing issues, as well as our financial and economic issues. The moment to make the changes now, and I look forward to being on this battlefield with all of you. Thank you so much. Councilmember Levine. Th thank you so much. I mean, th thank you, Mr. Henderson, for that incredibly powerful testimony. This whole panel, uh, such important remarks. And thank you for what you've done as advocates, as a movement uh, to advance this really inspiring policy. Um, I wanted to ask a question, which, which uh, I know Andy could answer, or maybe others as well, um, about just how hard it's been to get accurate information on the nature of our business relationship uh, with, with these banks uh, in terms of the fees and the interest uh, structure um, and, and why you believe we need to, to, to really achieve transparency through legislation. Um, so I don't know if, if Andy, you wanna talk about that, that question. And, and by the way, you're, you're listed as Dave Del Rio, who we, we adore. Uh, but you are, in fact, Andy Morrison, also from New, New Economy Project. But maybe you'd, you'd like just to weigh in on, on this point. Sure. Thank you, Council Member. And, um, and thank you, Council Member Levine, for your tremendous leadership on public banking in New York City. And yeah, we, um, we, uh, we foiled, um, you know, submitted a Freedom of Information Law request. Actually, I think we've done a couple of them now um, to the Department of Finance to understand I think I would put it like this, like if you, if you have a bank account and, um, and you, you get a monthly statement and it lays out, did you get charged any fees? Um, did you have a savings account that incurred that, that got, got interest? Did you have, um, you know, what kind of transactions? How much, what's the balance? What's the monthly balance? That's the kind of information we thought would be available. It's definitely not, as far as we can tell, available anywhere publicly. Even when we submitted a freedom of information request, it took a long time. It took, um, I think, months actually um, to finally get some semblance of information. And even after we got information back, uh, we didn't get all the information we were looking for. And you know, I we of course understand there are many, many, many accounts, um, and we of course understand that there's a lot of record keeping. But we're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars in some of the most that are being placed in some of the most powerful um, corporations on earth that have 
a, an abysmal track record on many things that the city um, has goals to achieve. So it just seems completely inconsistent that, for example, we're using Chase when the city um, is trying to tackle climate change and Chase is the worst funder of fossil fuels on planet Earth. Um, and that's just one example. We could go on for, for really the entire duration of this testimony talking about the things that are inconsistent um, with respect to the big banks that hold the, the overwhelming majority of our deposits. But that was our experience with the freedom of information law requests. And we just wanna see basic transparency. We think the public has a right to know um, about this information. And that's incredibly important context. And I think you just laid out the rationale for why we need a legislative solution here. So there's no FOIA request needed, the public can see it. And you offered a great analogy. You get a bank statement with this information as a private individual. Uh, there's no reason the public shouldn't know this about um, our money, the taxpayer money, and where it's deposited. So uh, th thank you again to this panel um, for this great work. Um, back to you, Mr. Chair. Back to council. <laughs> uh, council member Brooks Powers, would you like to ask your questions? Thank you so much for that. Um, I was um, wanting to speak on, in regards to the public bank that is, and that is because, and I apologize, and that is because there is a definite need to see support for um, MWBEs that need access to capital. And so I just wanted to speak out in support of the public bill, excuse me, the public bank as well. I'm sorry about that, it's nap time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, so now we have um, Ivan Young from Senator Sanders' office, followed by Jody Lidecker. Starting time. Good afternoon, my name is Ivan Young. I'm here listening on behalf of Senator Sanders, who actually had to be pulled into session at the moment. But I'm just listening to that testimony and I'd like to thank everybody for the support for his public bank bill. And um, please feel free to reach out to, to my office if you have any questions about the bill. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Jody Lidecker, followed by Tusif Hassan. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Drum and members of the committee. My name is Jody Lidecker, organizer at Cooper Square Committee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of intros 2099, 2100, 2164, and resolution 1600. Cooper Square Committee has worked with many tenants in the Lower East Side who have been subject to banks' unchecked lending. When banks loan money to bad acting landlords who buy buildings with a large percentage of rent regulated apartments, Tenants can be pressured into giving up their homes. Tactics include harassment, repeated buyout offers, or intense construction as harassment. Tenants may be exposed to dangerous and illegal work, lead dust, or other practices that make their lives so difficult it drives them from their homes. In addition, landlords sometimes withhold repairs or allow other unsafe and unhealthy conditions like garbage accumulation, pests, or mold, uh, when banks do not thoroughly vet and hold borrowers accountable, they can fund the displacement of New Yorkers, gentrifying neighborhoods and displacing countless working class individuals and families of color. So the city of New York's revenue is placed in deposit with large commercial banks that finance speculative real estate. But public banking will help us wrest control of public money from Wall Street banks and help us invest in historically redlined communities. So intros 2099 and 2100 will shine a light on New York City's financial relationships with these commercial banks. And intro 2164 would require New York City Banking Commission to provide meaningful notice of its public meetings and report its determinations of which financial institutions are eligible to hold the city's deposits. We urge the council to pass, uh, in addition, resolution 1600, which urges the governor and the legislature to enact the New York Public Banking Act. A public bank could support non-speculative housing models, such as community land trusts and mutual housing, such as the C Cooper Square Community Land Trust and Mutual Housing Association, Association, which is the city's oldest CLT. 
These models promote community control development and permanently housing, uh, permanent housing affordability and can help stem gentrification and displacement. So we strongly urge the New York City Council to pass intros 2099, 2100, and 2164 and resolution 1600 and to continue working with our organization and others to establish a municipal public bank as a matter of racial, economic, and environmental justice. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Tusif Hassan, followed by Linda Levy. Starting time. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Council, uh, and to all the staff members that made this possible. We really appreciate this um, event and the opportunity to testify. My name is Tausif Asan. I'm here representing NYPIRG, which is a statewide advocacy organization. Uh, we mainly organize college students, mainly public college students throughout the state. Uh, and today I want to testify uh, in support of Intro 2099 and 2100 in the context of this really being the first step uh, towards creating a public bank here in New York City. Uh, so many of my colleagues, uh, we work together on the campaign and they've really already belabored the point of uh, needing to make sure here in New York City that the way that we deposit our uh, public money is still in line with our values. Um, I really appreciate uh, Council Member um, uh, Levine's uh, questions earlier when asking um, uh, the New York City Banking Commission, you know, what are the credentials, what are the priorities that we have um, uh, in terms of deciding, you know, who does and who doesn't hold our public money. Um, and it seemed like they really, uh, you know, had a challenging time talking about um, things like, you know, how we invest with regards to the climate crisis. And so that's something that I want to talk about today. Um, here in New York City, we know that the climate crisis is real, right? We've been impacted by it very personally. If you were unfortunate enough to be in New York City when uh, Hurricane Sandy hit, you know how destructive uh, it was, right? Uh, we are still recovering. In fact, it's something that cost and is costing the city uh, billions of dollars and people died from that hurricane, right? Um, to use a more recent example, for the past two summers, um, Con Edison has failed to equitably um, provide energy in the face of the climate crisis and a, pay, uh, a failing power grid. Over the past two summers, we experienced uh, blackouts that were targeted in poor black and brown neighborhoods in the city, uh, like Canarsie, while whiter, wealthier neighborhoods were kept connected. Uh, this is a good time to mention that the climate crisis is, in fact, a racial justice issue. Issue, right, that um, it is the uh, poor people and people of color here in New York City and all over the world that disproportionately experience the negative impacts of the climate crisis. Um, and that's something that we really have to keep in mind uh, when we're tackling this issue. Um, and so where does the public bank come into place? Um, well, right now, we don't have any you know, public institutions that are an alternative to the Wall Street banks. And we know that uh, these banks are actively investing uh, in fossil fuel industries, fueling the climate crisis. Um, uh, my uh, colleague before Andy mentioned that Chase is the biggest bank here in New York City holding our deposits, right? They're also the biggest uh, funder of fossil fuels among the Wall Street banks. Over the past couple of years, they've invested over $268 billion in fossil fuel industries. And they're, you know, just the biggest culprit, but not the only one. Um, our uh, four of our, uh, our designated banks here in New York City um, account for over 30% of fossil fuel investments. Time expired. Uh, over the last couple of years, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. We cannot continue to uh, condone this kind of behavior, and we can't afford to have Wall Street investing our money in the climate crisis. If we had a public bank, not only could we take our money out of Wall Street and out of fossil fuels, we could take that money and put it into local renewable energy projects. We could uh, invest in small businesses that put solar panels on people's roofs. We can invest in public transportation. We could create greener spaces for climate resiliency uh, without gentrifying our neighborhoods, right? Because it would be communities that are most impacted that would be in charge of these projects if we had a public bank. So uh, we really urge uh, city council to pass intros 2099 and 2100, understanding that this is really the first step to creating a public bank, which is something that we desperately need if we're going to fight the climate crisis and all these other issues that my colleagues are going to be talking about today. Today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Linda Levy, followed by Gregory Jost. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the committee. My name is Linda Levy, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Lower East Side 
People's Federal Credit Union. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the introductions 2099, 2100, 2164, and resolution, resolution 1600. As you've heard from many of my colleagues this, this morning, these proposals will promote the vital public transparency that we need to get about the city's finances and its financial relationships so that we can begin to really seriously take a look at um, the creation of a, of a municipal public bank. Uh, the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union is a 35-year-old community development credit union that serves low-income people throughout the five boroughs. We have branches in Manhattan on the Lower East Side and East Harlem, as well as a branch on the North Shore of Staten Island. The majority of our members are low-income immigrants and people of color. Since receiving our charter in 1986, we have loaned over $120 million to our members. Last month alone, we made $11 million in PPP loans to small business entrepreneurs in our community. This is at the same time that we were hearing from the larger banks like Chase and um, the and Wall Street banks that the PPP loans were just not something that they could really possibly make to anyone other than their um, large business um, customers. We strongly support the creation of a public bank for New York City because we want to see more community development financial institutions like ours providing financial services throughout the city. We have been working really, really hard for 35 years, but we have barely scratched the surface of the need in the city. And that's because given the nature of our business, our capacity is very, very small. The public bank would be able to invest in and support CDFIs so that they would increase their capacity to serve every community. We've been involved in working on um, trying to create a public bank in New York City for many, many, for many years now, along with the New Economy Project. And I can tell you for a fact that we're very, very aware of the complications that it the complicated the complications that take place in trying to establish a financial institution of any kind, let alone a public bank. And that's why these. Um, introductions 2099, 2100, and 2164 are so critical for us to be able to lay the groundwork for the creation of the public bank, because without them, we don't even know where the money is currently sitting, and we don't, so we don't really know how we're going to then be able to take that money and what we'll be able to do with it. We want to make sure that everything is hand, handled in a safe and sound manner, and we know that this is a huge responsibility. These um, these bills would absolutely help us in create in figuring out what we need to do to make sure that the public bank will be a safe and sound financial institution protecting. Time expired. Um, <clears throat> and so, in uh, to in summary, I'll just say that um, we really would hope that. The council will pass these introductions and that the billions of dollars that New York City deposits in Wall Street banks will now go to serving the public good as opposed to supporting the extractive economy that the current um, banking institutions build. Thank you. Thank you. I will now hear from Gregory Jost, followed by Ben Fuller Guggins. Starting time. Thank you, and thanks, Linda. I will back you up 100%. Um, good afternoon, Chair Draw, members of the committee. Um, thank you, everyone who's spoken out in favor of this legislation thus far. Um, feel like we are in a great community of advocates here and, and legislators who want to make this happen. Um, my name is Gregory Jost. I'm with Banana Kelly Community Improvement Association. Um, I'm here to speak and to testify in support of intros 2099, 2100, 2164, as well as resolution 1600. Um, Banana Kelly, uh, if you don't know, we're a grassroots community and housing organization that's been fighting for community ownership, housing, uh, affordability, community wealth, and power in the South Bronx for over 40 years. Our work has been so necessary in part because for nearly a century, the banking industry as a whole has failed the Bronx and other communities of color across New York and the nation. Uh, whether through historic redlining and disinvestment that led to the fires and abandonment in the 70s, uh, the financing of speculative and predatory landlords in our neighborhoods, the fueling of multiple foreclosure crises, or the continued closing of branches that have left open the door to a proliferation of fringe financial services, 
Uh, Wall Street banks have profited off of a system that has kept many of our residents poor. And this has meant we've had to spend more and more of our tax dollars on undoing their damage. Um, that's the extractive economy that other folks or my colleagues have been talking about today. Uh, meanwhile, the city of New York has been backing these banks by placing tens of billions of dollars on deposit with them. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Um, I mean, we're, we're coming to our senses here and I think, um, you know, we don't want to be part of the same old tired model. And public banking offers this transformative yet very practical and tangible solution by enabling the people to wrest control of public money from some of the largest and most harmful corporations on the planet and instead create this publicly accountable vehicle that could invest in our neighborhoods and the infrastructure, and I use the term infrastructure very broadly, thinking about our, our organizations, credit unions, the, the work that you know, all of us rely on, that our neighborhoods rely on, and really advance a just recovery um, coming out of this pandemic. Um, I wanna highlight also just that one of our first national victories in the fight against redlining back in 1975 was the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which provided the data necessary to show that bank redlining was pervasive and expansive. And HUMDA, as it's commonly known, led directly to the passage of the 1977 Community Reinvestment Act, uh, which we know has CRA has done tremendous good over the past few days the decades, but we still, you know, it's not enough. And our state and our neighborhoods show we, you know, we need more tools at our disposal to reverse these decades and centuries. Time of expired. Investment. So in the spirit of Humda and disclosure, I urge the council to pass these resolutions, this legislation. Um, we're working with Linda and the um, uh, Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union. I'm bringing a community development credit union to the South Bronx because the banks are just not doing it. They're not cutting it there. So we need to invest in our different models that we've got on the ground. We've got a lot of tools at our disposal. So let's have the city back it up um, in this really powerful way. So thank you for this time and this opportunity to testify today and for your continued support, all of you members on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Ben Fuller Guggins, followed by Scott Trumbull. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Drum, uh, members of the committee. It's really exciting to be here at this uh, historic hearing. Uh, thank you all for the organizing advocacy to make this possible. Uh, my name is Ben Fuller Guggins. I'm the program and planning director at the Carroll Gardens Association. Uh, I'm here to join the other members of the Public Bank Coalition uh, to testify in support of intros 2099, 2100, 2164, and res resolution 1600. Uh, Carroll Gardens Association, we're an affordable housing and economic development grassroots organization that's been working in Brooklyn since 1971. Uh, we organize with tenants and domestic workers across the city uh, for permanent affordable housing, cooperative economics, and domestic worker rights. Um, and I just wanted to share from our experience uh, two core areas of our work uh, where we see a, a dramatic need for the public bank. Um, one that Councilmember Levine mentioned in terms of um, worker co-ops and access to the PPP. We currently support two worker cooperatives. One is a child care cooperative, and another is a residential and uh, commercial cleaning cooperative. Both are owned by uh, immigrant women and uh, domestic workers. Um, and since the pandemic, they've uh, lost over 90% of their work. Um, and unlike uh, many traditional businesses who've been able to access PPP, they've been struggling and trying repeatedly to get these much needed funds uh, because these are, these are also people who've been excluded from government stimulus or unemployment. Uh, so that's one area where we see a public bank would be transformative in the lives to supporting uh, worker cooperatives and also um, immigrant uh, workers across the city. Uh, the second area, as, a, as an affordable housing provider, we uh, in Red Hook in Southwest Brooklyn, uh, we see um, the difficulties in accessing financing and in developing new affordable permanent housing. Uh, we're currently exploring a, a new project that would develop over 300 units in Red Hook. Uh, this is a community that uh, drastically needs uh, new affordable permanent housing. Uh, the wait list to get financing from HPD is over four years. Uh, the options of getting financing through private joint venture partners 
um, is really burdensome for uh, small affordable housing providers like us. Uh, so a public bank would open up possibilities for, for us and other organizations somewhere else across the city to, to develop uh, much needed affordable housing. So we, we strongly urge the council to pass and showed 2099, uh, 2100 and 2164 along with resolution 1600 um, and appreciate all the work and support to, to make this hearing happen. Uh, we look forward to the passage of these, these intros. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Scott Trumbull, followed by John Paris Kavopoulos. Starting time. All right. Thank you all so much for this opportunity to testify. Um, and thank you, Chair Drum uh, and Councilmember Levine for your leadership on this. Uh, my name is Scott Trumbull. I'm a co-director at The Working World. Um, we're a nonprofit community development financial institution that provides financing and technical assistance to worker cooperatives or worker owned businesses here in New York. Um, we're also proud members of the Public Bank NYC Coalition, and, and we're here today because we want to express our support for introductions 2099, 2100, 2164, um, as well as resolution 1600. Um, these bills are so important. Um, not only because they would make city finances more transparent, but also because they would help pave the way uh, for the creation of a municipally owned public bank. Um, I've actually worked with some public banking institutions in other countries, and I can personally attest to the fact um, that public banks are game changers for local economies. They allow governments to fully divest deposits from destructive industries, such as fossil fuels and speculative real estate. Um, and they also facilitate meaningful investments uh, into, into local economic development, right? So that means more investment in affordable housing. It means more locally owned and controlled renewable energy. Um, and it also means more support for, for worker cooperatives and small businesses in historically redlined neighborhoods and communities of color. Um, in my role at the working world, you know, I've had the privilege to work uh, with dozens of, of worker cooperative businesses across New York. Um, and you know, these are these are businesses that are really like pillars in their community. They they are owned by their employees. They create good paying jobs. Um, they democratize decision making and they allow workers to share in in the profits, which, you know, for many folks can be a life changing thing. But they need, they need real capital to grow. They need investment. Um, and they're not getting it from Wall Street banks. Um, if we had a municipally owned bank that could partner with CDFIs like the working world, um, it could make a huge difference. We could drive more capital into the cooperative economy. We could make sure that local businesses fully recover from the pandemic. And we could build real wealth uh, in New York City neighborhoods. But to do this, we first need to better understand how New York City manages its finances. And we need a basic framework for how to form and regulate the bank. And that's exactly what these bills help, help to do. Um, so we'd like to urge city council to pass intros 2099, 2100, and 2164, um, as well as resolution 1600. Um, you know, these bills are really important step forward uh, in, in creating a more equitable equitable economy and advancing racial and economic justice. Um, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, and we'll now hear from John Paris Kavopoulos. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the committee. My name is John Paris Kavopoulos and I'm a member of the New York City chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America debt and finance working group. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of introductions 2099, 2100, 2164, and resolution 1600. These proposals promote vital public transparency about the city's finances and financial relationships and lay critical groundwork for the creation of a municipal public bank. The New York City Democratic Socialists of America is a member of the Public Banking Coalition and an organization of volunteers committed to supporting public policies that increase democratic control over the economy limit the extraction of wealth from working class communities, mitigate and reverse harm done to the ecosystem and create racial justice and a fair society for all. 
We believe that the creation of a public bank of New York City accomplishes each of these goals and that the bills being discussed by this committee today are a step in the right direction. Each year, the city of New York collects tens of billions of dollars in revenue from taxes and other sources to fund public services. Currently, most of this money is placed on deposit with large commercial banks responsible for systematically disinvesting in New York's communities of color, financing fossil fuel industries around the globe, speculating on real estate, and engaging in fraudulent and risky lending activity. Entrusting that money with these financial institutions betrays New Yorkers by using their tax dollars to support activities that they do not support. There's no reason why this money should not instead be kept on deposit with a publicly owned bank that can use these resources to invest in our community. A public bank is a financial institution created by a public entity that is owned by and accountable to the public. In this respect, public banks are no different from public libraries or public schools and are common worldwide. Public banks can serve as a powerful tool for, for local governments to invest in important areas that are neglected by the private banking industry, such as renewable energy, permanently affordable housing, and worker-owned businesses. Public banks can also remedy the shortcomings of a private banking system by prioritizing investments in neighborhoods redlined by the private banking industry, offering banking services to the unbanked and undocumented, and reinvesting profits in the public coffers. Public banks lower costs for government by eliminating the fees associated with retaining private banks as bond counsel or underwriters, and by providing low cost financing to government projects. A public bank would also provide useful competition to the private banking sector, which enjoys an unfair monopoly on the provision of financial services in New York, in spite of its deeply checkered history of failing to comply with financial regulations and fair lending practices, and chronic inability to invest meaningfully in the goods and services New Yorkers need most. When New Yorkers need affordable housing, private banks finance luxury condominiums. When New Yorkers need green jobs, private banks finance fossil fuels. When New Yorkers need to stay in their homes, private banks foreclose on their mortgages. For these reasons and others, we strongly urge the New York City Council to pass introductions 2099, 2100, and 2164, as well as, well as resolution 1600. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and for giving this incredibly important issue of public hearing and consideration. And I hope to work together with each of you on this issue in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, this will conclude our public testimony, uh, unless uh, if there's anybody that we've inadvertently forgotten to call on who is here and would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we will hear from you. And seeing none, Chair Drum, I'll turn it back over to you to close out the hearing. Well, thank you very much to uh, you, Rebecca, and to all of the advocates for coming out today. I look forward to continuing to work with you and, uh, and Council Member um, Levine on this as well, as well as the other sponsors, uh, Council Members Carnegie and Rosenthal. And uh, I thank you for coming today. And with that, this uh, hearing is adjourned. At 1247 in the morning or the afternoon, I should say. Thank you to everyone.